Welcome to the Behind the Scenes for Episode 100, Theft of the Dwarf Lord. As with each previous dwarf video and their accompanying behind the scenes, the purpose of this video is to help explain the tricks and manipulations we performed within Minecraft in order to strategically capture the footage we needed to make this video possible. For the best viewing experience, it's recommended that you take the time to watch the previous dwarf videos as well as their behind the scenes before viewing this one. That'll give you a full understanding of all the tricks we've done in the past and how our technique has evolved as Minecraft has been updated. Because this particular installment in the Dwarf series is actually a collaborative effort between myself and Example, I want to also bring in his video so that we can look at exactly every aspect of what we did in order to make this happen, because it actually is a pretty complicated process. So beginning chronologically, we're going to start with Example's video at the point where he notices that the vault door is open. He realizes that the gold is missing and he picks up several suspicious gold blocks off the ground. He mentions that he needs the help of Sherlock Cypherus, so that's where my video begins. I mentioned that I'm on my way to his base and I find another suspicious gold block right at the point where we would turn off to go to the end portal. I continue moving forward and we transition to the next sequence which involves both of our videos. I mentioned that I've arrived and we see in Example's view that he's looking at me through a security camera. After Example directs me to the vault and I see that the gold is missing, he invites me down to the security room to view the tape. While I wait in the room, Example heads to the back and in my view we get to see what he's doing through the security feed. After Example is finished and he returns to the room, we finally get to see what actually took place within the vault. As we watch the footage we see that someone definitely entered, stole all the gold, and then left. But the footage is too grainy for us to make out who it really is, so I ask Example if he's got another angle. Example then switches to another camera, where we see the same angle that he watched as I arrived. Example then rewinds the tape until we see a very clear shot of Humphrey. After chatting for a bit, I decide to continue the investigation, and we go our separate ways. I head back to the point where we found the first gold block, I trip down the stairs, and then Humphrey kills me. That's how the story unfolds chronologically, but for this behind the scenes, I'd actually like to move through the process chronologically. This episode has evolved quite a bit from its original concept, so I'd like to start there with the concept and move through all the decisions that we made that resulted in us ending up with the final piece. The entire episode is actually based on a simple gag we thought we could pull using the security footage of the vault. It starts facing all the way to the left and it pans across the vault, revealing that the gold as well as the Academy Award statue is perfectly intact. Once it reaches the right and moves back towards the left, we see that the vault door is open. And the camera continues to move strategically until it reaches a point where you can no longer see any of the gold in the room. Once it starts panning back to the right, we would see that the gold is missing. The method that I used to record this very mechanical style movement was actually accomplished using command blocks. When I press a button, it triggers the first command block which teleports me directly to the position I need to be in, facing the exact angle that I need to start at. After a small delay it triggers a timer that unleashes a rapid fire of another series of command blocks that constantly rotates me 0.25 degrees until the timer ends and then I stop at the point where I'm facing all the way to the right. Once I obtained that footage, I rebuilt the door in its open state, and I altered the coordinates in the command blocks to reflect where I ended, and I changed all the 0.25 degrees to negative 0.25 degrees, so that for the next time I used it, I would rotate back to the left. In the beginning, it felt like this gag had quite a bit of potential, but we started to run into problems as we moved forward with production. The first major roadblock happened when I started to animate Humphrey, and I realized just how massive this room actually is. As the camera panned back to the left and Humphrey appeared on the screen, it took him a very long time to move from screen left off screen right, and it just didn't make a lot of sense that at the speed he was moving, he'd be able to take all the gold before he appeared on screen again as it panned back to the right. Another thing that concerned me was the look we developed for the security footage. When you're watching this in color, it's actually not that hard to see the gag, to see the door close and then open and see that the gold is there and then it's gone. But once it's got all these filters applied to it, and especially when it's in black and white, it just doesn't read nearly as well that the door is open. You might not remember that it was closed in the beginning. You know, these things just sort of concerned me a little bit. So in the end, I decided to add an extra pass to show Humphrey in the process of breaking down the blocks that he eventually walks off with. The way I accomplished this was to add another command block on a delay that would use the set block command to sabotage the first hopper clock with a redstone block. 
While the first series of rotations is taking place, a delay has already been started on an entire second system, which waits until the first system is finished, then provides a small delay before starting the counter rotations to return me back to the original position. This of course allowed me to go left to right, stop, and then back right to left. While this is occurring, I logged in as third echelon AFK and I used the command to give myself the invisibility effect without the particles. Then I broke the gold blocks as fast as I could in creative mode. In the original planning stages, we had decided that as we started to watch the footage, we'd immediately recognize that it was Humphrey as the camera panned to the left to reveal him. But once we started to develop the look for this, we noticed that, you know, you really couldn't determine who exactly you were looking at. And as I said before, Humphrey was a lot smaller on screen than I expected him to be because the room is just so massive. In fact, I even scaled up the comp to 150% just to make it a little bit easier to see what was going on. This was around the time when I also realized that the angle we had initially used for the vault didn't really provide me with a good thumbnail to use for the video. So that's when we added the second angle of Humphrey coming in from the tunnel in order to get that nice clean shot of him. The process of getting Humphrey into the actual footage is essentially the same compositing procedures that we've done in all the previous dwarf videos, but there's one major improvement we've made that is going to make all future videos a lot easier to accomplish, and that's how we apply his shadow. In the first behind the scenes, I mentioned that I wanted to use ambient occlusion in order to accomplish Humphrey's shadow, but I couldn't use a full ambient occlusion because it would affect the entire scene. So back then, the solution that I came up with was to create a separate render layer for each face that he was going to come in contact with and render them all separate to compile them together to just affect those certain portions. Well, I looked into the ambient occlusion nodes a little bit and determined that there are in fact ways that I can manipulate them. So rather than having to render out several different passes of every single surface he comes in contact with, I figured out that I could do everything in just one single pass. Once we had Humphrey composited into the footage, it wasn't that hard to just apply some filters and after effects and get that security footage look that we wanted. Somewhere between finishing the vault sequence and starting on the sequence where Humphrey shows up in the tunnel, I jumped in Minecraft in order to brainstorm where exactly we were going to put the security room. I tried a few different places, but eventually I sold example on the idea of moving the beacon so that we could occupy that space with the security room by explaining to him that if the beacon beams weren't obstructing the view, he could put a very nice private lounge up here. In game, the TV in the security room is represented by eight black wool blocks, and I knew from the very beginning that I wanted to be able to see the security footage represented on that screen in our recordings before and after we look at the full screen view of the pre-rendered security footage. Originally, I was hesitant to use a resource pack to accomplish this because I thought that the high resolution textures were going to slow down the game too much, and I was going to end up having to put everything in in post using After Effects. That would have been a very time consuming process considering I would have had to do it for both my video and examples video. So from the very beginning it seemed like resource packs was definitely the way to go, but there was one thing I wasn't exactly sure how I was going to handle. And that was an idea that Example and I both had from the very start, that it would be very interesting if while the security feed was live and nothing was triggering its motion detection, if it would show an array of 8 different screens that would cycle through all the cameras in his nether base. So while I was testing out how exactly I was going to generate the textures for the resource pack, I knew right off the bat that I was going to need to generate some for the 8 camera multi-feed, the beginning and end of the vault sequence, and the beginning and end of the entry sequence where we see Humphrey the second time. Of these initial 5, the only one that actually had to be animated was the 8 camera multi-feed. And this is where my concern over these high resolution textures started to really come into play, because each of the 8 blocks representing a portion of the 8 camera multi-feed was not only going to have high resolution textures, but they were all going to be animated, meaning there were going to be multiple frames of high resolution textures. And I thought for sure that this was going to slow down the game, so we started to test out how the textures were going to look if we were to lower the resolution. And ironically, the lower we made the resolution, the better they actually ended up looking in game until we got to the point where we matched the native resolution of the default resource pack. When you're generating an animated texture in Minecraft, the way that you accomplish it is to create a column of all the frames that are going to be in the animation and accompany that with a .mc meta file representing that image that is basically a text file that tells Minecraft what speed to play each frame. The original way that I had attempted to accomplish this 8 camera multi-feed was to basically use the exact same column of frames for each texture, but adding a different number of extra frames to the bottom. 
If we simulate the principle behind the security feed by placing two sequences side by side, you can see that if we add one extra frame to the sequence on the right, even though they're using the same frame rate, the sequences become desynced very quickly. Now with eight different feeds going simultaneously, this gives us a very nice randomized transition between each sequence. Now this would have worked great in the project, except for the fact that we had to accommodate the optics compensation that we added that makes it look like the security feed is being viewed on an old CRTV. Because of this added border, it meant that each of the eight textures needed to have its own unique set of images. And this concerned me a little bit because of that curved edge, I thought that some of the camera angles might bleed into the texture that was going to be going on the block next to it. But as luck would have it, because of the low resolution, it turned out to not be that big of a deal. So once I generated a working prototype of the resource pack that had those five initial security camera screens, I sent it to example and had him meet me on the server so that we could work out exactly what expectations we had for each other on how we wanted the video to go. This was around the time that I pitched a little idea to example that because the VHS tapes were just retextured records, maybe we could use the mechanics of the jukebox to tell a little bit of a joke. So when he goes to put the security tape into the VHS player, out pops another VHS that's labeled Die Hard with a Vengeance. And this is just a little bit of an in-joke between example and I because he and I are both really big fans of the Die Hard series and quite often while we're playing the game, we're actually watching those films in the background. And we also like to give Macho Dagger a hard time because he's never seen any of them. Now this is also around the time that Example pitched the idea that I should be able to see what he's doing in the back room through the security feed. But this is where things got a little bit complicated, because in order for me to actually see what he's doing and have our footage continue to sync up, I had to physically be in the back room with him while he was swapping the tapes. One of the ways that we accomplished half the stuff we did in this video was by retexturing command blocks to look like nether brick. If I walk you through Example's trip to the back room with the default resource pack, you can see that as he opens the door, he's also activating a command block to teleport me into that room. And then once he's done swapping the tapes, he clicks another button, which teleports me back. Now these command blocks are actually not doing the teleportations themselves. They're using the set block command to place a redstone block to activate another series of command blocks, which both teleport me and temporarily set me into spectator mode so that I'm not visible within Example's view. These two command blocks are being powered by a repeater that's on full delay. And the reason for this is because I want this other command block here to be powered first. This command block has a clone command to copy this random assortment of blocks that's sitting underneath it. If we were to see these blocks within our texture pack, however, we'll recognize right away that it's actually an image that shows up on the security feed. And the reason, of course, that I want to have this command block activate before these two command blocks is because I want to have that split second where I can actually see that image of example entering the back room live on the TV in the security room before I get teleported into the back room to record the footage that eventually becomes the full screen version of that security feed. Now you might have also noticed this chain of repeaters here that activates this command block. This command block replaces the blocks again, this time to be the blue screen, so that I have something different to look at once I'm done recording the footage in the back room and I get teleported back to that original spot. Once I'm back in the security room, you'll notice that it says tape loaded, press play to start. This is actually a workaround that we had to develop because when I'm being teleported back into the security room, I'm also being set back into survival mode. So what that text actually should say is, your game mode has been updated. And obviously this would have broken the whole illusion. So the way that we went out to fix this was to change the language file within the resource pack so that instead of saying your game mode has been updated, it instead reads tape loaded, press play to start. It wasn't until much later in this project that I realized it would have been much easier for me to handle this by simply going into the game settings and turning off the chat. But of course, by the time I figured out that option was available, we had already recorded this portion. Now, this principle of using a button to activate a command block, to use the set block command, to place a redstone block, to activate another command block, to use the clone command, to change what's being shown in the security room, before then having a slight delay over the series of repeaters to activate another clone command to change what was being displayed in the room again, was essentially the backbone to this entire portion of the project. So after we determined that this was something we could physically do in game in real time, I set up a similar command block system for all the other security footage sequences. 
And this is when I realized that it wouldn't be that much extra effort to add a sequence where Example was able to see me as I arrived in the minecart, because we already had this texture looking down his nether tunnel that we could use to represent both my arrival and the beginning of the portion where we see Humphrey up close. Now, because all the other security footage sequences have been generated utilizing my aspect ratio, and because it's such a simple and repeatable action of simply riding down the minecart, hopping out and walking off screen, we thought it might be easier, rather than teleporting example back and forth, to simply re-record that action through the eyes of my camera account, third echelon AFK, so that I would then have the footage, I could quickly run it through the After Effects comp and send it to example when I was done. Now earlier in this behind the scenes, I explained that in the initial version of the resource pack, I had generated five security footage screens. After brainstorming with example and adding the portion where I am able to see him while he's in the back room, we had to add these two extra screens for a total of seven. Now try to keep in mind that the majority of the command block systems we developed have the sole purpose of changing what's being shown in the security feed by utilizing these textures. And as we went into the recording process, we had already generated the full screen security footage sequences for everything except for the portion we needed to record in real time as example went into the back room. So the rest of these command blocks are designed to allow us to record footage that essentially acts as a bookend for us to then insert that full screen footage later. So now that you've got a basic understanding behind how all of these command block systems work, I want to take you even further behind the scenes to help you understand what was actually triggering each screen change during the actual recording process. So you remember that as the recording begins, I'm heading down the rail line and example is sitting in the security room, simply staring at the wall, which is displaying the image of the entryway. Before too long, I hop out of the minecart to head towards the vault but the minecart continues down to the track underneath where it runs over a detector rail which switches the screen to the 8 camera multi-feed. This is the image that we're going to be looking at once we're done talking at the vault and head back down to this portion of Example's nether base. The next feed change occurs when Example heads to the back room to swap the tapes, and as we've discussed earlier, when he hits the button to open the door, he's also activating that command block which then changes the feed in the security room to the image of the back room before I'm then teleported back there to record that portion live. And after a small delay, the image in the security room then changes again, this time to the blue screen. Keep in mind that the button example hits after he's done swapping the tapes, which activates the command blocks to send me back into the security room and switch me back into survival mode, is the only button that example hits in this entire recording that is not specifically designed to swap what's being shown in the security feed. The last two command blocks which trigger a feed change are hidden underneath the buttons on the desk in the security room. When example comes back after the tape's loaded, he hits the button on the right, which changes the feed to the beginning image of the vault. Then after a small delay, that image changes to the ending image of the vault. This is when I then ask Example if there's another angle, and he presses the button on the left, activating the final command block, which changes the image on the screen back to the same entry image we used at the beginning of the recording, before going on a small delay and switching finally to the ending image where we see Humphrey. After we were done recording this portion, Example and I had to record the audio for the pre-rendered sequences that contained Humphrey in the vault and the entryway. The entryway sequence was very simple, we pretty much nailed it on the first shot. But the vault sequence was a lot longer and a lot more complicated. Example and I basically ad-libbed our discussion over Skype while watching the pre-rendered version of the video, and we recorded probably four or five different takes. Then when we were done, I took those takes and I tried to cut different bits of audio together to formulate a coherent piece of dialogue between us that covered the enormously long vault sequence. The most difficult portions to fill were when the camera would pan back to the left and Humphrey would be off screen for a good 30 to 45 seconds. That left a large portion of dead air where Example and I had no idea what to say to keep it interesting without being repetitive. So this is when I decided that it would be a good idea to just simply have us fast forward through that portion so we could get back to the part where we see Humphrey and keep things flowing. The other portion that gave us some trouble was when the camera pans to the right and holds at the moment where Humphrey's breaking down the blocks and throwing them into the pile. Now I hadn't really realized it until I had already gone to all the trouble of tracking this footage, but the delay that holds here is significantly longer than all the other camera passes back and forth. 
So essentially what we've got here is a similar problem to what we were able to fast forward through, except that because Humphrey's on screen, it simply doesn't make sense to have us fast forward through this portion. So after some brainstorming and a lot of hard work, I was able to take the actual vault security footage sequence and turn it into an animated texture so that we could then record that and cut it in between the footage we had and shorten it without it being too noticeable. And this was the final editing touch that we added in order to finish the portion of the video that takes place at Examples Netherbase. Now, for a long time, I had planned on ending episode 100 at the point where Example and I are discussing the prospects of getting a group together to find out what's been going on at the end. But once I had rendered everything that was done up to that point and had a chance to sit back and watch it, the ending felt a bit forced. And this is when I came up with the idea of adding the portion where I tripped down the stairs, but I want you guys to understand the complete significance of actually taking the time to add this to the video. You see, shortly after I released episode 99, back in September of 2014, I kind of realized I made a little bit of a mistake. On my channel, I've got two types of traditions. One type are the dwarf videos, which come out every milestone episode, and the other type comes out at the beginning of the year. That's the New Year's episode and the base progression video. Now, obviously after episode 99, I realized logically that the next episode is going to be episode 100. And there's not really any debating that episode 100 is definitely a milestone episode. So as per the way I do things on my channel, that would dictate that episode 100 would need to be a dwarf video. Now, I uploaded episode 99 on September 27th, 2014. That means that I really only had all of October, November, and December to crank out a dwarf video to be done in time so that I would be able to stay on track and be able to release my New Year's 2015 and 2015 base progression videos on time. Now, these dwarf videos take a very long time to put together, so I had to make that cognitive decision of whether or not I was going to just shoehorn in the next dwarf video to get it over with so I could stay on schedule, or give it the time that it deserved, considering this is episode 100 we're talking about, and then just live with the fact that I'm going to be uploading the 2015 New Year's video, as well as the base progression video, significantly later than I had originally intended. Now, I basically spent all of October working on a map for what was the original concept for what we were going to do for episode 100, which, believe it or not, has absolutely nothing to do with the security footage sequences. But... Once I finished the map, I realized that the plan we had was far too large to accomplish in a reasonable amount of time. It's probably going to take us a full year to see that one through. So we had to come up with a completely new idea on the spot with only two months left before January. And that's when Example and I came up with the idea for the security footage sequences. Now, we probably finished all the security footage stuff by around December 20th of 2014. So, I could have uploaded episode 100 back in December and then finished episode 101, which obviously is this behind the scenes, probably in early January and then only been a few days behind on getting the New Year's and base progression videos done. But as I said before, when I sat back and watched the video progress up to that point, I just felt like it wasn't good enough. It was lacking something. So that's when we decided to add the trip sequence, which took an extra two months to put together. Now, ever since I started the Milestone Tradition, it's actually significantly limited the amount of content that I could have put out on this channel. For example, between episode 99 and episode 100, there's almost a six month gap where I couldn't upload any new content because anything that I uploaded between episode 99 and episode 100 would therefore become the new episode 100, pushing the dwarf video off the milestone mark to episode 101. So with that said, I'm no longer going to be specifically binding future dwarf videos to milestone episodes unless they very conveniently happen to land within that episode number range. Now based on the response that I got from episode 100, I would say that the majority of the reason most of you guys are here is to find out how exactly I accomplished the trip sequence. So without further ado, let's move into that portion of the behind the scenes. Let's start by taking a look at the raw footage from this sequence without any of the added effects. As I entered into this part of the recording, I broke it down to three different stages. The first stage is me finding the gold. The second stage is me tripping down the stairs. And the third stage is the violent jerk in my neck that happens as Humphrey stomps on my head. So starting with the first stage, there are five gold blocks around the stairs. 
And because of the method I was using in order to generate the trip sequence, I needed to be able to summon those gold blocks to that precise location at will. So underneath this portion of the rail line, there's actually a button which when pressed activates these command blocks that summons the five non-despawning gold blocks to their precise location. Now you probably noticed in the raw footage that portions of my heads up display as well as my player's arm are missing. I went out of the way to try to do this in order to make it easier for me to track by removing things that might potentially obstruct the view of certain tracking points. But in the end I kind of wish I hadn't done this because it ended up being significantly harder to put all that stuff back in by masking every single frame and when it came to the tracking I only really used a very small portion of this recording before it then switched over to the trip sequence footage. You see, although they stitched together pretty seamlessly, each of the three stages were actually recorded separately. Before I started recording stage one, I logged in with third echelon AFK in spectator mode and I possessed Cypherus so that I would be able to see from the same point of view as the account that I was going to be recording with. Then I started broadcasting to Twitch and I brought up my coordinates with F3 so that as I recorded stage one with Cypherus, I was also recording the coordinates with third echelon AFK. Then I proceeded to find the gold blocks and run down the stairs. And I used the coordinates for that running down the stairs in order to calculate where I needed to be for each of the frames for the trip sequence. Then I translated that into a series of command blocks, each with the teleport command correlating to a frame in the trip sequence, allowing me to generate the footage using a sort of stop motion style animation on the camera, which in this case, of course, is the player. Now I found the timing and consistency of teleporting to be rather unreliable, so I'm not actually screen recording most of what occurs in stage 2. Instead, I took a screenshot of each of the 64 frames and compiled them together into an image sequence. Now in the final video, I'm tumbling head over heels down the stairs, and Minecraft doesn't actually allow you to flip your camera upside down, but the way that we achieved this effect was actually pretty simple. You see, within the teleport command, after you put in the X, Y, and Z translation coordinates, you also have the option to add the Y and X rotation coordinates. So for every frame during the tumble, I'm actually rotating forward an extra 10 degrees. And once I go past the 180 degree threshold, Minecraft compensates by flipping me around so that I'm facing the other direction. So in order to fix this, you literally just need to flip the affected frames upside down. And that takes the sequence from looking like a choppy mess like this into something a lot more fluid and smooth like this. Now, obviously, if you're taking all your screenshots in F1 mode, this is a piece of cake. But that wasn't really an option for me because for the sake of consistency, I really wanted to be able to see that black outline bounding box that indicates which block your crosshair is aimed at as I was falling down the stairs. So in order to make sure that our heads up display didn't end up at the top of the screen for the frames that we had to flip upside down, I made a custom resource pack to remove the hotbar and whatnot, and I'm holding a piece of paper that's actually invisible in a texture pack so that my arm doesn't show up on screen either. And I chose to do this instead of just using the invisibility effect in order to prevent the gold blocks that I'm picking up from popping up into my hotbar. Now, it turns out that the game's crosshair is actually not centered, so it does move slightly when the image is turned upside down. It is possible to just simply remove the crosshair in the resource pack and then put it back in using After Effects, but I opted to just automate a batch action in Photoshop to fix the affected frames. Now, obviously in order to successfully orchestrate the solution, it was absolutely necessary for me to have a clean slate of the Stage 2 footage and then take the time to add certain visual elements back into it later. And I understand that it might seem like a huge pain in the butt to have to go through all the trouble to do this, but from the standpoint of a visual effects artist, it's actually very liberating to have this immense amount of control, because it basically gives you full creative freedom. For instance, as I'm adding the visual elements back in, I could have just added my arm back in in its neutral pose, but I thought it would be a lot funnier to have my arms and legs flailing around as I fell. And because I took the time to separate the visual elements into separate layers, it gave me the opportunity to make this happen. As I said before, for stage 1 I had to key every single frame, but for stage 2 I just flew up into the sky and recorded my arm moving around, and then I keyed out the background by using the sky as a blue screen. And as you can imagine, in order to record my legs, I just simply swapped my arms and legs within my character skin and performed the same process. Now because the stage 2 arm sequences are so much shorter and more sporadic than stage 1, I could get away with using this simpler technique and then just color correct it to look more like the arms belonged in the nether as opposed to the overworld where they were originally recorded. 
Now, another thing that having all this extra control really helped out with was the tracking process. Because the purpose of motion tracking the footage is to translate my character's point of view into a camera in Maya, I didn't actually have to use the same footage for the track as I was using for the composite. This meant that I could modify the scene to make finding the tracking points a lot easier, and then generate a duplicate sequence using the modified scene. Now towards the end of stage two, there's that portion where I actually reach the bottom of the stairs and catch the sword. But this was actually an afterthought. You see, originally I didn't even think to have myself draw the sword before rushing down the stairs after Humphrey. And I realized how utterly ridiculous it was, given all my past experiences with Humphrey, that I wouldn't take the time to equip a weapon before rushing in after him. So luckily, since I had to mask every frame for stage one anyway, it wasn't that hard to incorporate this into the footage. So the sword that's actually bouncing down the stairs was added completely in post. Now, moving on to stage three, where my neck was broken, this part of the video happened so quickly that you probably didn't even realize that something out of the ordinary was going on. Because Humphrey's breaking my neck, we chose to simulate this by having a violent jerk in the camera over towards the right. And this is easy enough to achieve in Minecraft by simply moving your mouse over to the right to reposition your camera. But you have to keep in mind that I'm actually supposed to be laying down at the bottom of the stairs. And we had to simulate that by teleporting me down into the ground and having me face upward. Now, in Minecraft, when you're facing upward and you move your mouse to the right, you simply spin in place. So this was another situation, very similar to me tumbling down the stairs, where we had to perform some specific modifications in order to get the shot that we needed. And this time it was a bit more complicated than just simply rotating the image on its side, which, as you can see, we clearly couldn't do because it left all of this empty space. But really, going into this, we didn't have a clue how we were going to accomplish this shot. My first thought was to try to use the roll feature in MC Edit in order to rotate the set onto its side, but this had some disastrous results as we came to the obvious realization that stairs and slabs cannot yet be placed vertically. Well, I tried to think outside the box, and eventually I realized that I could go into my system preferences and rotate my screen orientation into a vertical layout. And I gotta tell you, it's a pretty surreal experience trying to play Minecraft in this layout. Even just navigating through the menus can be utterly mind warping. But in the end, this worked out perfectly to achieve the shot that we needed, and the final result turned out absolutely beautiful. So let that be a lesson to you guys. Don't plan your projects based on what you currently know how to do right now. Instead, try to dream big and use the full extent of your imagination, and then find the solutions to your problems as you go along. Because that's how you force yourself to grow as an artist. And if you find that you have to make a compromise, then find a compromise that improves your project instead of sacrificing your vision. Well guys, this marks the end of the behind the scenes for Theft of the Dwarf Lord. I spend months at a time putting these videos together, so I sincerely hope that you enjoy them and that you'll share them with your friends. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment. And while you're at it, I'd really love to know what your favorite aspects of the Dwarf videos are, because we've got some big plans for the next one, and I'd love to have your feedback as we continue to develop the story. Anyway guys, that's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.